All right, great. Thank you very much. All right, welcome back, everyone. The <clears throat> We're delighted to welcome Doug Gerlach, president of iClub Central, Inc. In this session, Doug will discuss how we can reduce risk by understanding the connection of risk and return. Doug, thanks so much for being here today. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, or uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our presentation. I'm going to be talking about building a defensive stock portfolio. Uh, five things that I think you need to know uh, as we look ahead to potentially a bear market, potentially more of a sideways market, or potentially uh, the, the uh, continuation of our bull market. Uh, and so we'll be looking at the, some of the things that I think are, are primary that you should know when you're investing directly in the stock market, as we do at iClub Central and our company. Now, we make tools for individual investors as well as investment clubs, and we publish two stock newsletters. Uh, and we use the techniques that I'll be talking about today. Our flagship newsletter is the Investor Advisory Service that was started in 1973. It recommends long-term stock picks uh, and has been named to the Holbert Digest Investment Newsletter Honor Roll for the last seven years in a row, acknowledging its performance in both bull and bear markets. Now, in 2012, we started our second newsletter letter the small cap informer this recommends long-term small cap stocks uh, with uh, an eye towards that buy and hold approach uh, and while we're still collecting our results there we have outperformed the Russell 2000 in the past uh, 52 weeks in the past uh, uh, two years ending in May in 2015 uh, we more than doubled the return of the Russell 2000 now it was a, a weak year for the Russell 2000 uh, but we were in positive territory with our picks so we're pleased with the results there for those investors who are seeking a little bit higher return from the smaller segment of the market. I just wanted to talk about that honor roll uh, designation because it is pretty significant. Only a handful of stock newsletters are acknowledged by Halbert, uh, and we have to outperform each bull and bear market cycle over the long term. So starting in 2000 in the most recent honor roll, uh, we according to Hulbert, are more consistent performers. We go up more than the market in bull markets and go down less than the market in bear markets. Now, there may be other newsletters that perform super well in bull markets but fall apart when there's a bear that, that rumbles through. So on average, our newsletters outperform uh, newsletters that aren't on the honor roll, and Hulbert says that's repeated almost every year since the mid-1990s when he started collecting that information. So we're per pleased with our performance, but we think that our techniques are those that individual investors who are investing directly in stocks can utilize in their own portfolio. And we've learned a lot of lessons in the last 40 years, uh, and here are just a few of them. Our primary belief is that the growth of a company drives the long-term stock appreciation. And this has been the case for the hundreds of years that public equity markets have existed around the world. As companies do well, as they see their sales and their earnings increase, their share price will go up over time. In the near term, lots of things will affect share prices. The election cycle, the economy, the weather, market sentiment, uh, the talking heads on television. All sorts of things drive stock prices in the near term. But over the long term, you have to be a successful company in order to see your share price go up. So our approach is to buy the most successful, the highest quality, the best possible individual companies that we can find at the best prices. That is our underlying approach and we don't deviate from it at all. Now we maintain a five-year horizon into the future and this allows us to see past the next down market, the next economic contraction. That five-year horizon is key to our concept of risk management because it eliminates the need to look at what's happening in the market from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, week to week, month to month, quarter to quarter. We're looking at that long-term viewpoint and it allows us to see things with a, a clarity uh, that you miss when you're focused on the, the, the minutia of market movement and stock price movement. So we're going to think about the big picture and keep that picture in mind at all times. This allows us to remain fully invested in the stock market. 100% uh, invested in stocks 100% of the time. There has never been a month in which our newsletter was published since 1973 in which our analyst said, sorry, nothing looks good right now. Uh, we're, we have no recommendations. 
every month they've recommended three stocks for subscribers to consider. So during the worst bull market, bear markets of the 70s, the bull markets of the 90s, uh, and every market in between uh, in that last 40 plus year period, we have remained fully invested in stocks. And this, we believe, drives our outperformance over the market. We never try to time the market. We think it's futile. We think it's impossible. We think that when you try to time and guess where the market is headed next, all you're going to do is miss the mark and then you're going to be missing out on the gains you'll be selling when the market is low and buying when the market is high you'll be seeing the inverse of what we want as successful stock investors this is a graph uh, taken from one of the software programs that we make a program called toolkit that allows you to look at uh, more than 8,000 publicly traded North American companies and you can see a 10-year history so on the top we have our uh, sales in green, this line right here. Uh, this is the pre-tax profit line. Uh, that's important to track. And here is the earnings per share line going up over a decade. And we've got a, a projection of continued growth of sales and earnings. What we don't see is a whole lot of deviation, a whole lot of gyrations between. We don't see the earnings going up and down. They're growing at a consistent pace. And then down below, we see here the I bars, the price going up as well. Now, you'll notice that here in 2008, 2009, you'll you'll recall what happened in the market at that point and you'll see here that the prices fell uh, of the share of this particular company even though earnings were still on an uptrend that's purely driven by the bear market by the fear of investors uh, of what was going to happen the prognostication that this was going to be the great recession to end all recessions that this was the bull market that was going to last the remainder of the decade uh, and within a year and a half that bear market resolved and the bull market returned uh, and so if you had the high the 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 foresight to be buying uh, this particular company when it was at these all-time lows when the market was telling every investor to stay out of the market and go to cash if you had been investing in these companies at these low prices you'd see a solid return until you get to today's prices uh, and again, our long-term focus helps us to take advantage of those opportunities. We don't see them as, as problems to resolve. We see them as opportunities to take advantage of. So our best defense is a good offense. We're stock pickers, so we're pr trying to pick the right stocks at the right price, knowing that this can work in any market as long as our time frame is appropriate. Uh, we also focus from appreciation because this allows our market our portfolio to grow when the market goes up and certainly our portfolio may shrink when the market goes down but it's not going to fall as much as the overall market as long as we're keep, we maintain that focus on high quality stocks and that takes me to our first step in building a defensive stock portfolio is to focus on quality and we measure quality in two ways. The first is that we invest only in stocks of companies that have a proven track record of profitability. They have to have positive revenues and earnings. They have to have been growing for a certain number of years to give us the confidence that management can continue to steer that company on that growth trajectory in the future. We're going to look at things like the future growth drivers. We're going to look at the tailwinds that might help push this company along. We're going to consider those in, in those factors that will affect future growth uh, and that will give us confidence that these are the kinds of companies that will perform well in the future uh, as long as we buy them at the right price. Now the second way that we look at quality is by focusing on the tax profit margins. The margins are simply what's left over after all the expenses have paid and we look at the pre-tax margins so we take the, the income tax, the corporate tax component out of it. This allows us to focus on the efficiency of the business itself, not the efficiency of the accountants and the lawyers to, to avoid paying taxes or minimize the tax 
uh, the tax impact that the company uh, will face in a particular year. But focus on what management is supposed to do, which is run the business, make money, and deliver profits to shareholders. So the profit margin, when we compare that to peers, It'll give us a good sense of how well that company is doing it. And we'll also look at the trend of profit margins over time. We want to see those margins growing over time, uh, not stagnant and certainly not deteriorating. And that will help us to continue to understand the, the metrics that are driving that business. Now this is another graph from our toolkit program. We use that software internally to generate the, our newsletter picks, uh, but it's also available for individual investors. And here's a great example of a company, a 10-year history here. This is the percentage pre-tax profit margin. Over here on the left, you can see that the margin was about 6 or 7 percent, perhaps. Uh, and even during the recession, this company continued to see those margins increase. And they've stabilized over the last five years, but they reached an all-time high in 2014, contracted a little bit in 2015, but have stabilized at that 33 percent or so range over the last couple of years. Now, that's a great margin uh, for any company. And this is Priceline. It's an international business. No in the U.S. for its name your own price hotel service. But globally they operate a whole lot of other businesses including Booking.com which is one of the leading hotel booking uh, services outside the U.S. where the hotel market is significantly more fragmented than here in the United States. So despite currency conversion factors that affected the economy recently and ha have hurt results a little bit in 2015 as the dollar is weakened, their international results are going to contribute more to it. But this is just a great example of a company that's focused on the bottom line, that's focused on efficiencies of their business and about making money for shareholders, delivering earnings per share. So we love to see companies like this, and we've been covering this company for the last year or so in our Investor Advisory Service newsletter. So our next, uh, our next, uh, my next word of advice today uh, is to not chase returns in your portfolio. A lot of investors uh, are attracted to stocks that are in the news, that have exciting uh, business lines, uh, that have all sorts of uh, sex appeal. Uh, but those stocks often have a high PE, often they have no PE because they have no earnings per share yet, and these can be especially treacherous. They'll see their prices fall precipitously during corrections in bear markets and sideways markets. They'll see their their prices fall because of bad outlooks and analyst downgrades. Our return is pretty modest. We're looking for a 15% annualized total return for our entire portfolio. And we do that by projecting the total return we expect to see from each company. Now we know that even if we project 15% total return for or, or better for each of the companies that we recommend, not all of them are going to perform as we expect. But our track record shows that about four out of five stocks that we select using our system, using our approach, will perform as well or better than expected. So our long-term rate of return in our Investor Advisory Service newsletter is just under 12%. Uh, and the overall market over the last 20 years is just a little bit over 11%. So that extra you know, half to three quarters of a percent return that we see from from our approach uh, will help uh, compound over time significantly. And, and if you think about the major mutual funds that, that aim to track the S&P 500 that always underperform because of their expenses, here we have a low expense, low capital gains exposure method of investing uh, that will help you to eke out that extra little bit of return that over time can contribute to major impact on your portfolio. Now today, in today's, if you look at uh, probably one of the highest profile stocks uh, that uh, is in the news just about every single day uh, that has no profits yet uh, is Tesla. 
A Tesla's 52-week high and low ranges from $140 to $280. Uh, that means that some investors out there uh, likely were buying as it was approaching $280. And then when it fell to $140, we're saying, gosh, i got to get out of this before it goes down even more, losing half of their investment there. Other investors might have bought when it bottomed out near $140, and now it's back to $200. They might be sitting pretty, for, at least for a time. But there's all sorts of speculation about how well Tesla can deliver profits because right now they're not making any money. They're in their startup phase. And it may be years before they show profitability. And while they may have a great product, it's hard to analyze the business until we understand how well that great product can deliver returns. So those are the, the types of fairy tale stories that investors often are attracted to. For us, it falls outside our discipline. And we believe that it's much better to be disciplined than to have a portfolio that keeps us up at night worrying and wondering. So if you are attracted to those higher risk kinds of stocks, we suggest that you set aside a portion of your portfolio, 5 to 10% of your investable assets, and use that in which to invest in these higher risk, more speculative stocks. Uh, the gains can be impressive when you find the right company and buy it at the right time. Most of the stocks are probably going to be net losers, but one big winner stock can, uh, can offset all of your losses uh, and contribute a little bit to your total return over time. But by isolating those, those companies in a specific percentage of your portfolio, you're going to protect the core of your portfolio that you want to be keep chugging along towards your long-term goals. Now, when we talk about the, the risk of your portfolio, uh, we like to manage the downside in some particular ways. I mean, we believe that our portfolio is going gonna, is gonna to perform well over the long term, but we do have a downside that we acknowledge exists for every stock in the portfolio. We know that every company that we select is not going to perform well, and there will be some companies that will perform poorly even though we've done our due diligence, we've done the research, there will be some, some uh, uh, a torpedo that comes out of the dark in the middle of the night uh, and uh, attempts to sink our ship. So we're going to set a downside price, and we're going to watch that downside. And when stocks approach or exceed that downside price, we're going to get rid of them. Now, one strategy that, that subscribers and investors can use is the, the use of trailing stop loss orders to protect on the downside. Everybody's afraid of the downside. Everyone's afraid of losing their capital, of seeing stock prices decline. We acknowledge that stock prices are going to go down. They're going to go up. Uh, there is a certain amount of randomness in the short term. But a trailing stop loss order, a TSLO, uh, is a tool that many investors need to become uh, acquainted with, especially when you've got highly appreciated stocks in your portfolio, especially during choppy or volatile markets, especially if you're concerned about a bear market coming or a recession that may, in fact, it, that may impact some of your companies. The trailing stop loss order is based on uh, a stop loss that doesn't require you to set a specific price. You set a percentage from the high price that the stock reaches. And that, that percentage uh, means that your stop loss price trails the stock as it goes up. It doesn't trail it on the way down, obviously. Uh, but if you've got a stop, uh, a stop loss uh, set, a trailing stop loss set at 10%, on your $100 stock, that means if the stock goes to $90, uh, your shares would be sold. Uh, and it would protect if the, that stock continued to go to $80, uh, then you would have perhaps come out ahead. Now, if the stock uh, goes from $100 to $110, uh, your stop loss is also going to go up. It's a 10% stop loss, so it's going to go, your stop, 10% stop, it's going to go up uh, to $91. Now, uh, it's going to continue to do that uh, as the stock goes up. If the stock price comes down, uh, the stop doesn't change. It's based on that high price that gets reached after you place that TSL low with your broker. So the advantage of that is that you can you can set that uh, percentage. Uh, and again, 
Some people use a 5 to 6%. That's very tight. Uh, there have been corrections uh, that would have wiped out your portfolio if you had a 6% uh, TSLO on every stock that you owned. 10%, uh, uh, that might be, uh, again, a point, that's, a, that's insurance. Uh, we don't see 10% declines across the market ever so frequently, uh, the, although they're not uncommon. But uh, so somewhere in that 4 to 10% range, uh, and again, you might look at the average uh, volatility of the stock over time uh, when it does have a correction that affects that company, how much does the stock price go down, what's the level of volatility in that particular issue, and that might help you uh, use those TSLOs to your best, uh, to your best uh, aims. You don't want to use them to sell your entire portfolio uh, and generate a lot of capital gains perhaps uh, and only to see uh, a week later every one of those stocks uh, has returned to that pre uh, pre stop loss uh, price now we want to be prepared mentally for down markets there's a german proverb that says fear makes the wolf bigger than he is that in our imagination the wolf is a terrifying beast and they're enormous and then when you encounter one uh, in real life uh, they're not nearly as vicious as uh, they've been made to be in fairy tales and in our imagination and bear markets are the same way fear makes the bear markets bigger than they are and fear is our enemy it drives irrational investor behavior Dalbar did a study in 2014 that found that it, because of fear, investors persistently buy when the asset price is high and sell when the price is low. Emotion rules the roost for too many investors. It causes us to act contrary to our own best interests. So we need to prepare ourselves for bear markets. We need to understand the logic and rationale and history of bear markets uh, in order to make better decisions. So here's a little bear market history. Since 1929, the U.S. markets have experienced 25 bears. The average bear lasts a whopping 10 months. Now, in our, again, in our imagination, uh, you may be thinking, well, bear markets can last several years, but the, the average bear uh, lasts, uh, lasted just 10 months. The average bear lost w loss was about 35%, pretty significant. The smallest was just under 21%, and again, a, a bear market is defined as a, as a decline of 20%. Uh, the largest bear market in 1932 not 1929, but 1932 saw a 62% drop in the market. Uh, the frequency, the average frequency of bear markets since 1929 has been every 3.4 years. But that's changed in the, uh, the, the, the later, later end of the uh, uh, 20th century into the 21st century. Our last bear market ended, seven, uh, ended on March, 29, uh, March 2009 and lasted 17 months. So it was longer than the average bear, but it was followed by the bull market that we are in right now, which is one of the longest bull markets on record. So the takeaway is that every single bear market that has ever affected the stock market has ended. On average, they've ended after 10 months. Even if it was longer as the March 2009 uh, ending bear market was at 17 months, we're still not talking about years and years and years. We're not talking about three, five, ten years. We're talking about shorter periods where the market uh, can, it continues to, to stumble along uh, before that bear market resolves. So it's important. This is really a key. Uh, for us to keep in mind and not be driven by fear uh, if we have a bear market, if we have a sideways market uh, that persists for a while. Uh, and we're going to actually do our best to take advantage of that bear market. We're going to think 
past the bear market in the recession. And I keep mentioning our five-year horizon. This allows us to think ahead. If bear markets happen every three and a half years on average, and that, that average has been lengthening uh, in the, uh, the last uh, couple of decades, uh, if recessions uh, only happen every five to ten years, uh, our five-year horizon into the future, future will help us see beyond the end of the next bear market and the next recession. It allows us not to obsess over the short-term market gyrations, not to get caught up in the roller coaster of despair that comes when the market declines and when our stock picks have not worked out well. We don't predict, we don't change our strategies during bull or bear markets, and we remember that over the long term, the stock market is always bullish. Capitalism works. If capitalism didn't work, then none of you would probably be here today. Uh, you would be out in Idaho with your bunker stocking up on ammunition and, uh, and, and gold uh, and uh, uh, food, canned food. Uh, you would be cut off from the world uh, and you would be uh, ready for the coming apocalypse. Uh, but you're not. You're here on your computer. You're here to, to talk about and to think about ways of rationally looking at the market. And it's this truism is something that I think everyone can keep in mind, that over the long term, the market is bullish. The market persistently drives upward, uh, and there is no indication that any of the worst, uh, the worst outlooks that, uh, uh, that uh, the economists, that the government uh, across the world uh, can foresee will change that long-term upward trend and the drive towards increasing success for well-managed companies. So bear markets to us are opportunities to build wealth. When we say that, people go, how does that work? How do you, how do you build wealth during a bear market? Well, because we understand that well-managed companies will continue to grow. The managers of, of good businesses don't go on vacation when bear markets and recessions come around, when tough times come around. They get to work. They deliver efficiencies at a greater rate. They seek them out. They try to, to come up with the best strategies they can to continue to grow their business. But their stock price is down. So for us as investors, we can look for opportunities to invest in those well-managed companies that are on sale, that are selling at a discount to the same price they were selling at a couple of months earlier. Volatility can be uncomfortable for us as investors, but it also provides a second look at companies that might have seemed expensive not too long ago. So for us, the bear market allows us to upgrade our current holdings with higher quality or higher total return candidates. Growth companies, well-managed companies, quality businesses often stand out in recessions and bear markets because they're the ones that are not reporting uh, continued bad news. They're the ones that uh, are, are continued to chug along to post news and updates and quarterly results uh, that are positive. They are the ones that uh, are making acquisitions of other weaker businesses that can't make a go of it during during bad times. So our our strategy is to seek out those kinds of businesses and hold them through the rest of that bear market, uh, and then move uh, ahead with our entire portfolio. So to recap, we want to focus on quality. We want to manage the downside. We don't want to chase returns. Uh, we want to prepare mentally for the down markets because we know they're going to come. And we want to think, think ahead. What's going to come after the bear market? What's going to come after the next recession, whenever those might be? And the answer is it's going to be good times. Uh, so we don't want to miss out on the opportunity to, to get them there. So I wanted to uh, present just a couple of uh, ideas here. Maybe there's, we'll have some time for questions, uh, but some recent stock ideas from our two newsletters. These are pretty uh, are all what we consider well managed companies. Uh, there are a number we're seeing some themes in the market right now. The kinds of companies that we look at, but you can see this table has the uh, our ticker symbol, uh, the company name, the industry, uh, the uh, current price here, the projected total return, the projected earnings per share growth, the PE, the our suggested buy price and sell above price and the reward to risk ratio. That measures our upside to our downside. We like that to be greater than three to one at all times. 
uh, or for stocks that we're buying. So the first is for Tusa, an information technology uh, kind of outsourcing business. Current price is $35. We're looking at 17% growth from this business, which will give us a total return of at least 23% a year. Uh, current PE is just 17, and we see it as a buy up to $43. We've got a number of banks. We're, we're seeing banks and real estate investment trusts increasingly coming up on our screens. Uh, there's uh, I think the reason for that is uh, people are uh, investors are looking at banks and going, oh no, interest rates are going to go up. How's that going to affect their business? Well, if interest rates go up, they're going to be making more from the new loans that they're making, uh, and that will be a very positive thing over the long term. Columbia Bank is these are all regional banks, and we see a lot of value and uh, good management in those regional banks. Columbia Bank uh, is in the uh, Pacific Northwest. Customers Bank Corp is in the uh, Northeast. Uh, Pennsylvania up to the Boston corridor, Bank of the Ozarks in the uh, in the the, uh, the uh, Arkansas uh, and that area, uh, and we think those are all have a tiny dividend yield uh, for some of them, and uh, uh, but uh, slower growth uh, but good valuations right now. And we like Airlease. We've been following this company in both our newsletters for several years. It's performed well for us. It's an air, airplane leasing business. Does business with. Airlines around the world, uh, their order book is full through 2016 uh, into 2017 and into 2018. Uh, they, so their, their orders are all lined up. They've raised the capital. They're buying the planes. Uh, they're leasing them to the airlines. They get the income stream. Uh, it's just a great business, well run. Uh, and uh, again, we're not worried about the cost of capital going up a quarter percent when interest rates go up. So we think that uh, it's got a lot of uh, upside uh, to that company as well. So those are just a few ideas for you to take a look at that meet our uh, criteria, stocks that we follow in our newsletters. Uh, if you have more questions or if you want more information, uh, you can visit the websites at smallcapinformer.com and investoradvisoryservice.com. And you can also email me. Please give me a, drop me a line if you have questions, uh, if you're interested in subscribing. Uh, I have some promo codes that can help you out at gerlock at iclub.com. Um, so thanks you uh, all for joining us today. Uh, if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer a couple of them. But I hope you're enjoying your, your e-money show, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time for sure. All right, Doug, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, we did have just a question pop in. Um, they were just curious. They said, what about cores, K-O-R-S? Oh uh, yeah, Michael Kors. We've uh, we followed that in our newsletter in the past. Uh, they, uh, uh, I think, they reached a, a point at which uh, they were finding it hard to to continue to drive sales and earnings. Uh, they have been opening uh, local uh, local businesses or local local stores, uh, retail stores on their own, uh, working with apply, uh, um, department stores. Uh, Michael Kors is a maker of uh, primarily high end. Uh, luxury kind of watches and uh, accessories, uh, and uh, again we we uh, we recommended selling it. We just felt like the uh, uh, the growth had really been slowing down, uh, and uh, part of it is this is a, something we've seen before with Coach. We followed Coach for a very 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 long time. Uh, a lot of these high fashion uh, accessory uh, luxury good makers. Uh, as tastes change, uh, if they don't adapt, they find demand for their products declining. Uh, and I think uh, Coors, uh, we were we got into it just a little bit too late. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is uh, it's probably one of those companies that's a little less um, a little less popular in the minds of consumers than they used to be. And, and again. It's really tricky investing in retail stocks uh, and restaurant stocks because tastes change so quickly, uh, and you have to be on top of them. So uh, it's not a stock that we're following anymore. It's not a stock that I have a firm opinion one way on the other or the other about. Uh, I was impressed with how well they were running the business and uh, how how rapidly they had scaled up globally, uh, and they certainly do have pockets of strength around the world where their retail operations are doing better. Uh, but all in all, it's a tough business to be in, uh, and I think that there's better places for our money uh, right now in, in this cycle of the market. Uh, so uh, that's my take on Michael Kors. All right, thanks so much for that. Um, that was the only question we've had so far. Uh, we do have just a little bit of time here left, folks, so if you have any questions, please feel free to 
uh, type those into the question field in the GoToWebinar platform. I will relay those along and we'll get those answered for you. I'll just go back to our, uh, my, our, the, the, some of the ideas that we have here. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I'm a big fan of a lot of these regional banks. Uh, the multi, you know, the, the national banks and, and global banks have been struggling uh, recently, but a lot of these smaller regional banks have been acquiring, uh, it, they're, they're benefiting in many, many ways from the, the, uh, the, the, the problem that large national banks have uh, with their growth is that there's just it's hard to grow your business uh, as a national bank, uh, and uh, so what they end up doing is buying a lot of smaller regional banks, uh, and then they end up with a lot of uh, uh, branch overlap. So they've got to divest those particular branches. So some of these regional banks are involved in in snapping up. Uh, and expanding their territory by taking advantage of those those uh, the acquisitions of the larger banks, uh, it's an interesting trend. Uh, and, and I'm definitely not a fan of of the larger banks that are out there. Uh, but we've been covering uh, really increased our coverage of the regional banks in the last uh, in the last two years, uh, and they just uh, continue to. Pop on my total return screen, and I think that they're uh, they're in interesting areas of the country and can deliver some good good potential there. Uh, yep, go ahead. I had a question uh, about air lease that's on the screen. Um, they were just asking if you were concerned about the the debt load that air lease has. Yeah, well, uh, air lease, uh, interesting, here in the industry uh, list, I say rentals and leasing. Uh, in the airplane leasing business, they're also uh, affected by trends in the transportation in sector, uh, but they're also a finance company. They're a financial business. Uh, so what they do is they buy expensive airplanes from Boeing and Airbus, and then they turn around and lease those airplanes to... Uh, to airlines. Those airlines are responsible for the maintenance and the insurance uh, as well as the lease payments uh, and AirLease aggressively writes down the value of those planes on the books because they're the owner of them and then when the lease is up uh, AirLease takes ownership of that plane again. In many cases they can release that plane out to another airline uh, or they can sell it outright, uh, and they've been very good at uh, selling those uh, planes that come off lease, selling them uh, to airlines around the world, uh, and generating a profit by doing that. They're actually making money selling those used planes compared to the value that those planes had uh, been carried on the books. Uh, so in terms of their debt load question, uh, this is how the business operates. They need capital to buy planes. They get capital in two ways. They get capital from uh, selling shares of stock, and so they've done some public offerings uh, and some secondary offerings, uh, and they also raise money from by borrowing it from banks and other investors. Uh, when they started the business, they knocked on a whole lot of bank stores and said, will you loan us money? And they said, well, you know, you're, you don't really have a track record, so uh, come see us later. Uh, and after the couple of years of operations, uh, the, the, uh, the reverse happened. The banks started calling early saying, ah, you guys are doing really well. Do you need some capital? We'd love to, we'd love to offer you uh, some, uh, some, some capital uh, to lend you some money to continue growing your business. Uh, and so Airlease is very... Uh, very committed to managing their cost of capital uh, to make sure that they can deliver a return on that cost of capital uh, and the money that they've been borrowing right now they're able to 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 uh, uh, to invest they are just about investment grade just just at investment grade uh, in their their debt rating by Moody's and s and p uh, and uh, you compare that to Delta uh, and uh, American, uh, which are sub-investment grade debt ratings. Uh, so I think that says a lot for, for air leases, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the debt that they have. So when you look at air lease, uh, you got to look at it from the perspective 
of how well they're using that capital uh, and the cost of capital. Uh, and Airly's has in their their uh, their their filings uh, and their their analyst uh, 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 conference calls talks about their cost of capital and what their target cost of capital is, uh, the return on that uh, capital, uh, and how well they are moving towards that goal. I think, in my opinion, that they're doing a good job. Uh, they're getting there, uh, and so I'm not at all uh, worried about the, um, uh, the the increasing debt that they're taking on because I think they're utilizing it. Remember that the this is a global business, and the global air traffic is uh, growing at more than 5% a year. Uh, so it may not be growing in the U.S., but elsewhere around the world, uh, people are flying a whole lot more. So there's a big demand for airplanes. There's a demand for, for airplanes that are more fuel efficient, that, have, uh, that can carry more passengers per plane so that airplane, airlines can increase their revenue. There's a lot of aging planes that are out there, so there's a big demand for uh, airlines to upgrade their fleets. Uh, so I think if you put it all together, it, it makes a really compelling story uh, for the early stock. All right, thank you so much. Uh, this next question, I might have to throw in a shameless plug here. Where's a good free place to get good stock ideas? Um, I would say moneyshow.com and our San Francisco Money Show coming up in August. But uh, is there is there anywhere that you would you recommend as well? I'm a big fan of using uh, of finding your own stock ideas using a stock screening tool, and there are a lot of free stock screening tools uh, and in order to use a stock screener you have to know what you're looking for uh, and there are no stock screeners that say here are the stocks that are guaranteed to go up so you have to refine your approach uh, the tools that we used are based on uh, methods uh, that were developed by the nonprofit organization better investing uh, formerly known as NEIC or the National Association of Investors and uh, they teach people how to invest in the stock market and teach them how to uh, look for stocks what are the attributes that you're looking for I think that's the best thing uh, you know if you uh, and I say that even though we provide stock newsletters uh, our subscribers are pretty high performing investors in that they uh, do not just randomly select a stock that we present. Uh, the three stocks that we present in the Investor Advisory Service each month uh, tend to be one more aggressive growth pick, one more, a little more conservative, maybe paying a dividend. Uh, one might be smaller, one might be larger. Uh, they spread out into different industries. Uh, so we try to cover uh, and present ideas that, that in each issue, there might be one stock that you find fits into your portfolio, it fills a hole, or is a, a company that you're comfortable holding. So it's a research service that we provide. Uh, we're whittling down the 8,000 public companies in the U.S. and North America to the couple hundred that fit our long-term model of, of solid growth uh, earnings and revenue potential, uh, and then finding those in that, within that couple hundred uh, universe, finding the handful of stocks that any, at any month uh, are the best possible candidates for total return that we can find. But we leave it to our subscribers to build and construct their own portfolio, to diversify their portfolio and figure out which, which stocks uh, will work best for them. All right. Uh, looks like we have about about three minutes. We had two questions that popped in. Um, one, they were just wondering if you had any ideas about where the energy sector is going. And the second one was um, if there's a special industry that you think is is going to be doing the best uh, in present times coming up. Well, we because of our bias towards growth, uh, the energy sector very seldom uh, uh, delivers candidates that fit our long-term growth. It's just too cyclical uh, and too capital intensive uh, for us in most uh, instances. So uh, our take on the energy sector, my take on the energy sector is that we're, we've, we're really seeing a major change in how electricity Electricity is generated globally, not only in the U.S., but in other, other countries. We see countries like Portugal and Germany recently uh, uh, generating 
uh, you know, nearly 100% or or 100% of their total energy consumption from natural sources, from wind and solar, geothermal, tidal, etc. Uh, and so that's just phenomenal. Uh, and this is uh, I've also read stories where uh, oil is going to become so devalued that uh, the, the old concern that we're going to run out of oil, it looks like demand is going to end for oil long before the supplies uh, are fully tapped uh, and that a whole lot of drilling and exploration uh, that's going on in, in, uh, in, in borderline areas or in difficult to reach deep sea areas is just simply not going to be profitable. Uh, so I think that that, that shift is going to take some time before it kind of solidifies uh, as uh, you know and solar is just there's nothing about solar and wind energy. It's very hard to find investment opportunities right now but they are having a big impact. And so uh, I continue to, to not see the energy sector as a, a growth uh, opportunity uh, anytime soon. In terms of, uh, and then the other question was uh, sectors to look at right now. As I mentioned, real estate investment trusts, uh, I, I think regional banks are, are interesting to look at. Uh, um, biotech. Uh, is uh, continues to be strong. Pharmaceuticals not so much, but I think there's there's opportunity in biotech. There's been a little bit of a pullback on some of the contract developers uh, recently, like Perexel and Lanet and uh, uh, Icon, uh, and I think there's opportunities with those companies in those sectors. Uh, healthcare I think is also a, a, a sector that has a lot of opportunity. We have some good performers in our small cap newsletter and in and in our investor advisory service newsletter that come out of the healthcare sector uh, and that's just going to continue as the population continues to gray we're going to see more and more uh, healthcare uh, uh, demands being placed uh, on society uh, and so a lot of companies there are going to perform uh, I think we're going to see a lot of perform continued strong performance uh, in the years ahead uh, information technology firms again uh, tend to we see, we see, I think we see shifts in the information technology outsourcing, uh, uh, that uh, that whole aspect of running businesses by hiring, uh, hiring firms to handle a lot of the software development and uh, uh, business processes. Uh, but again, as companies, uh, as we, as if we enter into another recession, we're going to see an, a new round of companies trying to find efficiencies, and I think a lot of efficiencies come from outsourcing, closing down uh, internal operations in favor of technological solutions. Uh, so right now we're at the end of the last cycle, um, and there's uh, demand seems to be slowing for those business process outsourcing and IT service companies, uh, which means the prices are coming down a little bit, PEs are coming down, but I think that there's a, a sh that uh, we're, we're seeing opportunities uh, that will pay off over the long term, uh, even though we don't know when that next, uh, the next uh, shift will come as we head down the road.